Good evening and welcome. Welcome to Bible study. We're here for part 12, Jesus in the Old Testament. This is, in fact, the final lesson on this topic and a little more on that coming up shortly. All right, now the most important thing is to welcome Sister Phyllis Gibson. Thank you for being here. Sister Vicki Washington, you also. Deaconess Maxine Smith. Wishing a good evening to myself and all the church family and friends. Thank you much. And I'll be looking for Brother Gary on the conference line. Uh, as always, I need to mention to those who may be joining us for the first time, on, especially for anyone who is watching this on, on replay, um, class starts at 6.30, but we come on at 6.25 and we begin the lesson at 6.35. Just give us a chance to assemble and get on one accord. So if you're watching on a delayed basis and you want to fast forward in 10 minutes, you should be okay as a result of that. All right. We have a good evening and blessings to all from Pastor and Co-Pastor Carpenter. Thank you and bless you as, as well. This is our, our final lesson and as with most final lessons, we may run a little short of our regular hour or a little bit over, but we're, we're going to finish this topic tonight. We'll be resuming from where we ended last week with the Old Testament prophecy that the sky would darken before Jesus' death. We're, we were kind of in the middle of that. And... Yeah, I see my brother Gary on the conference line. Good evening and welcome welcome to you for Jesus in the Old Testament, Part 12. Uh, Reverend Dr. Robin E. Woods is welcome, welcoming the church family with a good evening. Glad to have you here. This is Part 12. Uh, our, our next topic is actually going to be something that was going to be like a necessary introduction to the next topic, but it's such a big topic in and of itself that it is going to be a, a separate subject. Uh, it will be on the structure of, of the Bible. Uh, right now we're looking at all the Old Testament prophecies. The, you know, these weren't good guesses or anything else. The Bible is obviously supernaturally written by the Holy Spirit and therefore has all the omniscience, knowledge, and everything else to do this. But also, we need to understand, as we, as we study, what is so special about the Word of God. It is in book form, and the word Bible itself actually means book, but it is completely separate and apart than any other book that we will ever encounter. And really looking forward to that. It's, it's been a lot of work, still working on it. But really looking forward to that. And in fact, if you, if, you, if you know somebody who was one of those men wrote the Bible people, somehow arrange for them to drop in on about any 10 minutes of that and see what they have to say then. All right. Sister Pam Reed, welcome. She's with us on, on YouTube. Sister Dorothy Dyes with us on Facebook. Saying good evening to everyone. Bless you all. Uh, all you guys are joined by Brother Gary on the conference line. Our opening scriptures for tonight. We have two verses, and we've been there before. We're kind of coming full circle here. John chapter 5, verses 39 and 46. John chapter 5, verses 39 and and 46. It's only two verses. We're not going 39 to 46. Now, since we'll be starting a new topic next week, it might be a good time for you to get somebody to come in and, and, and jump in and, and study along with us. Uh, for those who are new, uh, there's a bunch of scriptures with every lesson. We got to gotta know what the book is telling us. And because of that, those scriptures are made available prior to to each lesson each week via email if you request them. Now, all of the topics, the ones scrolling across the screen now, I never remember the number. It's been like 23 or 24 when we started during the pandemic. 
Uh, they always remain available on, oh, I need to change Twitter to X. <laughs> I'll get to that sometime. <laughs> on YouTube channel, Dennis Carpenter. And we'll put that address on the screen so you can get there. That's not it. That's the website. There we are. YouTube.com and DC Bible Study. That address has every lesson. This lesson itself will be there probably within a half hour after we finish. And that will allow you to go back and depending upon where you are in your studies, in your life, your circumstance, there may be a topic of particular interest to you. And you'll be able to go back and get into those lessons and the scriptures for those lessons also remain available. You send an email to Philadelphia Prayer, P-H-I-L-A-P-R-A-Y-E-R, at gmail.com and specify the lesson. You know, what's the topic? What's the number? You say, I want them all. That's fine. But, you know, just let us know and they'll be sent back to you, as I always say, in a reply to your email to make sure we get the address correct. Okay. Now, see, Sister Michelle Evans is with us on Facebook. This Jackie Mack and Mike Mack have both joined us on Facebook. Keith McBride, greetings to you. As always, he's faithful. He's here every week. Good to have you here. Sister Arena, also with us on, on YouTube. And Brother Bernard has joined us on the conference line. Amen. Caught you early this week. <laughs> This is part 12. As I mentioned earlier, this is the final lesson on this particular topic. Uh, Sister Annie Warlock, good evening to you. And yes, thankful for obedience to our Lord. Uh, thank you for, for appreciating and, and, and understanding that. This is, this is a, a look at the omniscience of God. The fact that he has a plan, that he knows the end from the beginning. This is what gives us faith and trust in his word. There, there, is, there is no guesswork. There's nothing to override God. There's nothing to change what he says. We can talk a, a good game, but we need to carry this with us every day, every place we go, because we have an enemy who does everything he can to try and sow seeds of doubt. And right now the Holy Spirit has us on, on a mission with this Bible study to, to knock that out. To let us all know once and for all what the word of God is. We're, we're going to be in investigating truth and, and how God uses numbers in, in, in nature as well as spiritually. And we'll look into what is known as, as gematria, but it's all going to be focused on us understanding the word of God is what God says it is. Amen? All right. Now, we have a couple of more minutes. I, I think we've taken care of the housekeeping. I had to make myself a note to change Twitter to X. There may be a reason for that, but I don't know what it is. I'm not particularly interested. <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll get started with John chapter 5, verses 39 and 46. We'll read those. Uh, said we've, we've kind of broken them down before, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. Then we'll have prayer. And then we'll pick up from the Old Testament prophecy that it would get dark right before the death of Jesus Christ. That's the precision of the prophecy. Not that there would just be this day where everything went dark, but it's timing relative to the crucifixion, which itself was an awesome prophecy delivered almost a thousand years before the event. Now, once again, Anybody who just joined us, this is our last lesson on this particular topic, part 12. Therefore, the time will be what it is. It's not going to be radically different, 
but if it's short of an hour that is not a problem and if it runs a little over we hope that that will not be a problem but we will conclude this topic tonight next week our topic will be part one in what I can only call the structure of the Bible God has supernaturally designed and constructed his word and it's just an awesome thing to understand at least it is for me okay it's time for us to get started John 5 39 and 46 and let me see if anyone else has joined us seem to be clear conference line got brother Gary brother Bernard we are ready okay this is the Philadelphia prayer praise and worship center church Bible study my name is brother Dennis Carpenter and we're here for part 12 Old Testament prophecy Jesus in the Old Testament presence and prophecy that was the full title of this subject all right let us begin and see brother brother Marvin and sister Jackie Higgins have joined us uh, Kathleen Gillard I don't know if I had caught you before everybody's on board Let's get on one accord we're John chapter 5 verses 39 and 46 let us begin John 5 39 search the scriptures grammatically that's what you call an imperative <laughs> it's telling you do this for in them you think you have eternal life and they the scriptures are they which testify of me we see constantly the New Testament was just referring back to the Old Testament sometimes quoting it directly sometimes not 46 for had you if you had believed Moses you would have believed me because he wrote of me and you know we've been going through that for the last 11 lessons the Messiah had been written of and of course not completely understood by the people of that time but they knew that the Messiah was coming whether or not they fully understood what was being said is a different issue always know said God is never making this up as he goes he does see the end from the beginning and Jesus Christ the manifestation the incarnation was written of all the way back in Genesis 3 15 all right let us pray Heavenly Father thank you as always for what you've provided what you've protected us from what we don't even realize that you've done for us God but everything that was involved in getting us from last week to this week and we're anticipating God that you will do what you need to do as long as I get out of the way God and and let you have your way for your glory so that we can all get a little more wisdom a little more understanding a little more appreciation and yes a little more reverence for you and your word so we're looking forward to this God and we just thank you for this ministry for for this church for all these years God that you've watched over us and it's not because we deserved it God it's only because of your grace and unconditional love amen last week we read that the Old Testament told us that the sky would darken before Jesus's death uh, good evening it's uh, brother Mike Robinson is with us we're going to go to Matthew chapter 27, 45 to 50. Should be familiar scripture to most of us, especially this time of year. Okay, Matthew 27, 45. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And as I may have mentioned earlier, even secular history records this, this event. 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. Because 
he spoke in Aramaic, the language of the high priest. And it was particularly directed to them because they would have recognized it as Psalm 22. But there were others, of course, who didn't really understand what he said. 48. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And straightway one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. I went back because we, we had mentioned that there were things he refused that were narcotic in nature. The vinegar, the sour wine, was okay. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So we have the timing with the sky darkening, but it was written about in the Old Testament. Next, the Old Testament informed us that the kingdoms will be the Lord's. I'm going to go to Obadiah. Obadiah chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. I realize I just skipped over verse 49. We're okay. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites even unto Zarephath and the captivity of Jerusalem which is in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The geographic references were simply to indicate an area that enclosed a lot. Operative phrase, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. We're going to go to Psalm 22 and to Revelation 11. Psalm 22 and 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. So in Obadiah and, and, and Psalms, we're told twice, two witnesses, the kingdom is the Lord's. So to Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Which is one of our prophecies from last week. He will be the last king. He will replace all earthly kings. Yeah. Reasonably familiar story for most of us is Jonah. Who was swallowed by a specially prepared fish. Why do I think that's important? Because... When we teach our children that Jonah was swallowed by a whale and then they go to school and some teacher <laughs> explains to them that a whale's throat is only barely big enough to swallow an orange, that is actually enough for them to doubt the truth of the Bible. So, get it right. Jonah typified the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's three things, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Jonah 1.17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Why do we say the death, the burial, and the resurrection? I was surprised at one point to find out that something that Jonah didn't die. Yes, he did. There's no air in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. <laughs> Jonah died. Let's go to Matthew 12 and 40. For as, once again, not like, it says as, meaning these things are going to be lined up to a T. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, translation thing, 
so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's something that Jesus himself actually expressed. Now, the Old Testament let us know something else. Not only that the Messiah was coming, but it told us that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Let's go to Micah. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler, the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's straight up. Out of you, little Bethlehem. Well, let's go to Matthew 2 and 1 and see what actually happened. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. In Luke, Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. That's where he was designated to go for this purpose, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Not only was the, the prophecy that he would be born in Bethlehem, but it, it, it took the secular taxation to get Joseph, because remember, he went up out of Nazareth. That's actually where their home was, to Bethlehem, and it was there that Mary, once the days were accomplished, delivered the Messiah. Now, one of the general things that we know of, about the, the Messiah, like so much of the rest of us, is specifically prophesied by God. And when we, when we got to the New Testament, we saw some of the reasons for the detail, the specificity, if you will. It's because we can't afford to walk by sight. We have to see what corresponds to Scripture. And that's why John's disciples were told these are the specific things he's doing, causing the lame to walk, the blind to see, the things that lined up with what was written in the book of Isaiah. We don't even necessarily know if what we see is miraculous. But God always says, try things against my word. So the Old Testament told us that the Messiah would proclaim peace and bring the gospel of peace. Well, good evening. We got Rosemary Owens and, and Sister Tammy Green with us. Amen. Joining us, we're going to the book of Nahum. See, we've been to Obadiah and Nahum. We, whole word. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. He being the wicked. There's an end to this. Let's take a look at John 16. And then we'll go to Romans. And then we'll go to 2 Thessalonians. Because this is the big deal. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Because Nahum said he's going to publish, he's going to proclaim, he's going to announce 
peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 10.15. We're talking about the peace. And this is the, the same peace that's written about in, in Philippians. The peace that passes understanding. Romans 10.15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 16. Now the Lord of peace himself, that's another name, the Lord of peace. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. That is, is, is such a, a key phrase. Once again, you can just run right by that. But he's going he's gonna to give, he's going to give me peace. Always, in every way, by all means, whatever it takes. The Lord be with you all. That's a promise. No matter what, no matter how stormy, no matter how bad it is, by all means, in all ways, the Lord will bring peace. He will give you peace. We don't always accept what we're given from the Lord. In our, in our everyday lives, we have to know that as human beings, sometimes we can have a tendency to, as they say, have a pity party. And you know what it takes to avoid that? That little thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks. Thanksgiving to God ends a pity party. Next. The Old Testament announced that the Messiah would come to the latter temple. Meaning a temple later. To provide peace. So this had real significance at the time it was written. We're going to go to Haggai. Because we, we know that the old temple had been destroyed and then they, they built a, a, a later temple that wasn't quite up to what some remembered. And, you know, the word of God writes about this combination of joy and, and tears over the same thing. Because there were some that just didn't feel that it reached the glory of what had been there before. But Haggai 2, verses 6 through 9. But let's say of the Lord of hosts, yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. See, whenever you get these ands, it's, it, it's so you get the point. And I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. The desire of all nations, of course, being a Hebrew expression for the Messiah. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts, because it all belongs to him. Now, the cattle on a thousand hills, it's all his anyway. Verse 9. The glory of this latter house is shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Promises about peace are, are significant for, for most of us because we, we are kind of pretty easily knocked off our square. And if we don't consciously say, wait a minute, I need to get back, we can pick up momentum rolling rolling downhill. 
And God says, your peace is going to come from my spirit abiding in you and you recognizing who I am. That I am your father, that I'm all powerful, that I love you unconditionally. Yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know how it goes. Let's go to Matthew 12 and 6 in the New Testament. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Is Jesus bragging? No. He's telling the truth. Mark 12, 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? And Acts 10, 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now, why do we include Mark 12, 35 about the fact that Christ is the son of David? He's letting them know that right here and now in this temple is the one that was written of. Like the parables and like everything else, not everyone can hear what he's talking about. But he has to let them know that this human being standing in front of you is also the son of God in the latter temple. Yeah, we talked about the specific details of this. Well, the Old Testament told us that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. It got all the way down to that. Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. I like the way I did that. Okay. <laughs> New Testament. We go up to Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye, the daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, and a colt the foal of a donkey. And you know how much I love how he comes back the next time. He, he, is, he is suited down, and oh man, it's, it's just awesome. Revelation 19, I, I just love that. Another detail, the Old Testament, the Messiah's price money would be used to buy a potter's field. Yeah, yeah, so, so some guys got together and wrote this. We're going to Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, there's going to be a, a little note at the end of this, just to make sure we get it correct. Zechariah eleven twelve reads, And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear, then don't. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Yeah. This is why we have a note here. We have fulfillment in Matthew 27 verses 9 and 10. But we got to read it carefully. It doesn't refer back to the scripture in Zechariah. All right. So the fulfillment doesn't refer to the scripture, the written word. It does something a little different. Matthew 27, 9 and 10 reads, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken, not written, by Jeremiah the prophet, saying. So that's 
That's what I'm saying. It, it, it doesn't reference what was written in Zechariah. It doesn't even reference what was written in the book of Jeremiah. It said, which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And, you know, if you study that and you go to the Old Testament, you know that 30 pieces of silver used to be the price of a slave. And like everything else in the, wor in the Word of God, whatever you choose to investigate and dig a little bit into, there will be some, some fruit. There is a reward to that. Still in the book of Zechariah, we were told that soldiers would pierce the Messiah's side. We're going to Zechariah chapter, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Let's take a a second look at this. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. The spirit of grace, obviously referring to God's grace. It's it's those it's those two words of the what's the spirit of supplications? That's a spirit that acknowledges who God is and that acknowledges God's capability of supplying and meeting all of our needs. Supplication always has included with it, God will you, never God can you. Then, of course, in 10, he's referring to the bitterness for his firstborn. This is the this is him abiding within within us. They shall mourn for him as I mourn for my only son. They shall be in bitterness for him as I am in bitterness for my firstborn. Well, then. Why did you send him to do this? You get back to John 3.16 again. For God so loved the world. That needs to become a reality in, in, in our hearts. Once again, for whom would you sacrifice your firstborn child? God did that for you. So to John 19.34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And yes, there's a multitude of things to be understood from that. <laughs> Revelation 1 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And we're talking about clouds of witnesses. Good evening, Sister Rochelle has joined us. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Awesome. <laughs> what is even more awesome, as I said, we could we could go through this again and do another do another twelve lessons. I mean if you recall, at the, at the beginning, we didn't specifically get into all of the sacrifices, which obviously were representations and, and types for, for Jesus Christ. 
this is this is the word of God, and you need both pieces of this. And you, you can't just get a New Testament and, and think you got this thing. What were we else, what else were we told? That the disciples would scatter before the crucifixion. Now, you know, we, we you know, we're more familiar with everything that happened afterward. But we have to recall the events prior to that. Well, we're still in Zechariah. But you know, we're going through the Old Testament, so we don't have much further to go. We got Zechariah and Malachi, basically. Zechariah thirteen seven. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. We're going to Matthew twenty six. We're going to read verses 30 and 31. Then we're going to jump down to verse 50 and read 50 through 56. Okay? Matthew 26, 30 reads, And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, offended meaning cause to stumble. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So Jesus himself is quoting scripture. 50. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, and laid hands on Jesus, and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, and drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priest, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? He said, I'm allowing this to happen, because this is what I came here for. 54. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled if I did that? Understand that thus it must be. He said, the word is true. It's all got to be fulfilled as written. 55. In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? You had plenty of opportunity. I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Once again, for us human beings out here, some of you might exist on a higher level, I don't know. Until the moment actually comes, you're not necessarily sure of what you're going to do or how you react. You know, not not just just Peter, but you know, any of the disciples, you know, we're 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 with you no matter what. We're with you until the end, even unto death. And then the moment comes and you don't hang in there like you said you would. It's because we're folks. And that's something you deal with God about. Through repentance, through prayer, and you move on. After doubt, another one of the devil's biggest weapons is guilt. Because our expectations of ourselves are sometimes higher than they need to be. We have to keep moving forward. What is done is done. God looks at our heart. I meant what I said when I said it. I just kind of overestimated myself. You know what? That's what human beings do. So in this situation, all the disciples forsook him 
That's not something that you can't recover from. When you make promises and commitments, obviously we're supposed to fulfill them. But there are times when we come up short. And you know what that amounts to? We are saved by grace. So if you disappoint yourself, don't double down on it. Get past it, understand it, learn from it. Maybe the next time I won't speak out like that. So, so I don't have to embarrass myself. But that's what happened. All the disciples ran. They were with him. They, they were with him unto the end. But when the time actually came, they left. And they had to because scripture said that they would. Let's go to Mark 14, 27. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written. I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. The Messiah would be preceded by a forerunner, well established in Scripture. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, I put that in caps, meaning we're going to look at that a little bit. I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, the new covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And my messenger, of course, referred to John the Baptist, the forerunner, but not the only one. Let's go to Matthew eleven ten. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Mark 1, 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And in case you missed it, Luke 1, 76. And thou, child, this is the baby John being born, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And further in Luke 7, 27, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So not only was there a recognition factor with the Messiah himself, but, in fact, Jesus' disciples were asking him, you know, is, 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 is John Elijah? Scripture said the, messen, the, the Messiah would be preceded by Elijah. One of the, well, I find it somewhat interesting in the Old Testament is you always see Elijah referred to as Elijah the Tishbite. Except when it comes to this, then he's Elijah the prophet. Well, what's the difference? Well, we know that Elijah was translated. He didn't, he didn't see death, just as Enoch was translated. And then in Revelation 11, we have the two witnesses, and that's when you make, make the hook up there. So this, these references to Elijah have to do with a, a secondary thing. But that was actually contingent upon us accepting the kingdom of God on earth. As it turned out, the kingdom was ultimately rejected, and then we have all of the things that follow all the way through the book of Revelation. So John the Baptist could have been Elijah, but in fact turned out not to be. Now, go to Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. See, it didn't say Elijah the Tishbite there. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let's go to Matthew 11, 
13 and 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. And that's how Jesus responded to his disciples. And that's why he said, and if you will receive it, this could have been it. But of course, we know that it wasn't. That brings us to the end of the Old Testament and therefore to the end of the prophecies and the presence of Jesus in the Old Testament. So I have my closing note. Finally, these connections, what we've gone through through these 12 lessons are not the imaginations of man. You know, nobody's conjuring up this, it's there. The Bible provides the validation of the study by its own testimony through the words of Jesus and others. He is our covering. That covering is, is about the protection, the provision, and all that comes with it. That's what that's what a covering is. That's that's what the parents are for 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 their family unit. What comes with that covering? What that protection and provision includes is blessing, joy peace, strength, and life. Amen. Thank you. That concludes our, our study of Jesus in the Old Testament presence and prophecy. Where we go next, we will be dealing with the structure of the Bible. How God is actually put his, his word together and all of the spiritual and supernatural things that are included that make it absolutely impossible that anybody other than God could construct his word the way that he does. We are doing that on route to what should be a, a very lengthy and complete study of the Apostle Paul and the Pauline epistles. So if you can, God willing, be with us next week and I just removed our lesson title because we're moving on. Ah, I see Olivia Wallace is, is with us on, on, on Facebook. All right. Well, I said we might we could conclude a little early as being the last lesson. So it's time to remind you, as always, to deliver your prayer requests to Sister Norma by noon tomorrow. And before I get to our closing comments from Pastor and Co. Pastor Carpenter, as I said before we started. With where we are going in our examination of God's word, which is God, we're going to be looking at the word as, as truth and just doing it from a standpoint that we understand how special and, and blessed we are to have received this from God and how he designed it so that man really couldn't mess it up. He said that his word will stand forever. If we, who are referred to as jars of clay, are fearfully and wonderfully made, then how well constructed is his word that it will last forever. Right. Now our closing comments, and then we will close out with prayer. Dear PPP and WCC family and friends, thank you for joining us for Bible study tonight. Co-pastor and I, along with Brother Dennis, our Bible study instructor slash teacher, thank God for the honor and privilege to minister to each of you in and through the Word of God. This privilege is never taken lightly, so thanks again. Be safe and be blessed. 
with the love of Christ, Pastor and Co-Pastor Carpenter. Amen. I always appreciate being appreciated. For those who choose, may bow your heads, let us, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we have simply taken a, a pause before we continue on, on this journey, God, and just experienced the privilege and, and, and the joy of being able to look into your word, to, to receive the blessing, the, the in, instruction, the wisdom, the conviction, everything that it has for us, God, because no one knows better than you, no one loves us more than you, no one is more awesome than you. So we're just thankful for the opportunity and the privilege, God. We know that there are places in this world where people would, would have to be risking their lives to do what we do every Wednesday, God. So let us not take that lightly and take this opportunity, God, not, not just to, to thank you for, for what you've done for each and every one of us, what you've done for us collectively, what you've done for our ministry, God, but... Just place place a name or or a face on on our on our hearts, God, that we can call out in prayer. That that we can strengthen the body by our care and love for one another, Lord. That we seek out opportunities to be blessings to others, and that we just go forth with the knowledge and peace, God, that you've secured our eternal life, and now it's up to us to help someone else enjoy what we enjoy through your grace. We love you, Father. We're doing our best to to be like 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 Jesus. We 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 don't get there, God, but we we can't be discouraged when when we fall short, God. Our humility lets us know we're just folks. <laughs> our hearts aren't perfect, our actions aren't perfect, but you are perfect, God, and and we exist through your grace and your mercy, and we're just thankful, God, for every day that we have another opportunity to just move a little further, to finish this race, to press toward the mark. So we lift up this ministry, God. We, we lift up these, these lessons, this teaching, all to you, God, submitted to you for, for your approval, God, for your direction. And we're just thankful, God, for everything you do, everything that you are. And this prayer is dedicated to you in truth, in trust, in thanksgiving, God, for the unspeakable gift of your only begotten Son, because you so love the world. Thank you, Lord. Good night to, to all of us assembled here, to those who are not visible but are present, God. Everything to the glory of God. Thank you all, and thank you, Lord. Amen. Good night. Thank you all, and said God willing, we'll be back next week with part one looking into the structure of the Word of God.